Hello members, welcome one and all and good evening. Uh, it's not quite as sunny as it has been for the rest of the week, but I think we're going to be transported to the sunnier climes of Portugal this evening. So I hope that you will join me in opening a couple of bottles to celebrate that. So welcome everyone and thank you again for joining. Uh, Portuguese wine fans, I'm sure you're all incredibly excited. And if you're less familiar with Portuguese wines, then you actually could not really have two better speakers to guide you through this evening and the three wines that we've selected, but also a bit of an overview of the regions that they come from too. So our two speakers tonight are our buyer for Portugal, Joe Locke MW and Sarah Ahmed, who is a major authority on the wines of Portugal. And we've just been discussing, um, I will allow Joe to do an introduction, but has been working with Joe for, for many, many years um, and has, is just launching an amazing festival that we're going to talk about as well, celebrating Portuguese wines. So before I allow Jo Locke to do the more formal introduction to Sarah, a few very small pieces of housekeeping. First things first, I can see some of you already using it. We do have the chat function enabled this evening. Please feel free to let us know where you are, what you're drinking, have you been to Portugal, what's your favourite Portuguese wine? Uh, and we also love a few food pairing ideas in there as well. So please feel free to use that freely. If you have any questions, and we will have time for questions, particularly at the end, but maybe throughout the session as well, pop those in the Q&A button, because we've got Tim Schwilk from the tastings team behind the scenes tonight, managing that Q&A for us. So we'll be able to feed the questions directly through to Sarah and Joe at the end of the session. And then last, but by no means least, uh, with two speakers this evening, you do have an option on how to view. Uh, some of you might just be seeing one face at the moment, and that means you're on speaker view. If you'd prefer to see all the speakers' faces, or more accurately, Sarah and Joe's faces, you can switch to uh, gallery view. Now, on laptops, it's usually in one corner where you can do that, uh, or alternatively, you can swipe from left to right. Or you might prefer, pardon me, to stick with the speaker. There's a small presentation as well, which I'm going to be managing behind the scenes. So hopefully you've got your screen nice and large and we've done a lovely tech test already and everyone is sounding beautiful and looking beautiful this evening. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Joe Lock MW to introduce Sarah. Good evening and cheers, everybody. Good evening, everyone. And thank you so much for being here. Um, it's a real pleasure for me to be able to introduce Sarah to you. We were just chatting and realised that we've been crossing paths in, in the industry for the last 20 or so years. Um, but Sarah had a really interesting background. And funnily enough, she's not the only, only one in the, in the industry to have, to have had the same background because she started in law, um, came from a very different place, although what she has brought with her um, is a real exacting um, skill in terms of the way she analyzes wines, talks about wines and writes about wines. She goes under the name of The Wine Detective. So if you haven't discovered her website, do have a look at that. It comes up immediately um, when you search for it. Um, so please have a look at that. Um, so yeah, so from law, Sarah went to Odbins, the, the great Odbins as was, which has been such a training ground for so many good people in the wine industry over the years, um, and then took the very brave decision to go independent. I'm, I must say, I mean, I don't know how old you were at the time, Sarah, but it must have been at a pretty young age. So it was a very brave step to take, um, but you seem to have thrived on it. You know, it seems to have really suited you. And you've always specialized. One of the reasons that I think our paths crossed often is that you used also to specialize in the Loire, and we share a love of Chenin Blanc, uh, which of course was another love in South Africa. But in, in more recent years, you've honed your specialism further still um, to Australia, which is a great love of yours, um, and Portugal. Um, and of course it's Portugal that we're talking about this evening, but if you are a keen Australian wine enthusiast, again, there is plenty of great material on, on Sarah's website. And the reason that we're getting together now is that having bumped into one another, I think at the Wines of Portugal tasting back in March. Yeah. That was the first I'd heard about this exciting event that you're involved in organizing called FESTA. 
Um, and it just, it everything fell into place. It happens in the at the end of the week when our next 1874 magazine comes out, in which Portugal is the lead feature, which I was thrilled about, as you would imagine. Um, and I think we've got nine of the producers that appear in that particular magazine are also taking part in, in your event, which is 50 or 50 more producers. So it just sounded fantastic. Um, hence, here we are. Um, so, Sarah, won't you tell us about um, Festa? And, and, and please, along the way, do tell us bits about yourself that I've forgotten to mention. Yeah, <laughs> uh, you, were, you were pretty comprehensive, but um, I always thought that um, going under the name The Wine Detective, partly I chose it because I was a litigator when I was a lawyer. So it was the sort of forensic skills that I applied to the much more pleasurable uh, substance of wine <laughs> than law. Um, and uh, and yeah, it's been great. I've known Joan, Joan, we were working out probably about 20 years or so. Um, and uh, our paths have crossed regularly. And uh, if I'm writing about uh, Portugal, Joe certainly someone who um, I value her opinion. And, uh, and, and, and Joe and I have also judged together at Decanter World Wine Awards on uh, Portugal. And uh, it's always great to to have Joe on board. So thank you, Joe, for the introduction. So Festa, let me tell you about Festa. So Festa means festival in Portugal. And, and I think Portugal has perhaps, you know, the most festivals a year than any other country in the world. Um, but obviously coming out of uh, lockdown, especially, um, we thought Festa was a great name because it's about ce celebration. And I think everyone was ready to sort of get back in the fray and celebrate. Um, so what? So Festa, as the uh, you see the logo there, it's a Portuguese wine festival by uh, Bardoro. It's taking place at Tobacco Dock in East London on the 24th and the 25th of June. And uh, why Festa? Well, first of all, a bit of a, a personal sort of intro. So you could say that absence makes the heart grow fonder, or absence makes the heart grow Festa. In fact, because. The festival's founder is uh, Max Graham, who was brought up in Porto, and his dad is Johnny Graham, who founded Churchill's Port House, and whose family founded Graham's Port House. Um, Max is now based in London, but homesick for Portugal, a taste of Portugal. Uh, he established Barduro Restaurants um, in London, um, the first in 2016 at London Bridge, the second um, it's, uh, in the city. And uh, they specialize in petiscos, uh, which I'm sure Joe, as like me, enjoyed a lot of them on visits to Portugal. Um, but they're small plates. Um, and the wine list is 100% uh, Portuguese. Um, I hosted some winemaker dinners um, at Bar Douro for Max in 2018. And I think it was that same year that I said to Max, I'm going to this amazing wine fair in Portugal called Simplesment Vigno. And it's a fantastic uh, meet the maker fair in, in Portugal um, with an artisanal and cutting edge focus. And what's really nice about it is, is the makers are there and they are behind a barrel. Uh, so it's not like there's a table dividing you and the winemaker, it's just much more intimate. And we both really loved that wine fair. And uh, we started talking about, oh, maybe we could do that in London, that would be great. Um, but it, I suppose it took uh, missing Portugal and Max's trips home uh, to his family and my visits with producers, I usually go several times a year, uh, to really spur us um, to bring a taste of Portugal to London this summer after you know two years of, of more or less not being able to travel there. Um, and although it's wine centric, uh, Festa is about showing Portuguese wines in context. Um, so the makers are going to be there to talk about their own wines and share something of their own personalities, because I'm sure Joe would agree that Portuguese wines, are, they're just so chock full of character and personality. I think when you meet the makers, I suppose it's a little bit like people say about dogs, you know, dogs look like their owner. There's a little bit of that about the wines as well. So that's some of the context. 
Uh, and then we've got Portuguese food, Portuguese craft, Portuguese music. So there's going to be a food court with leading Portuguese chefs and restaurateurs, including Barduro, of course, but also uh, Leandro Carrera of the Sea the Sea, so a real fish expert with his new book. And there'll be signed copies of that available. Uh, Volta de Mar, um, a Covent Garden Portuguese restaurant, and uh, Roulotte, which is a, a pop-up. And you see there their famous, probably artery-busting Bifana sandwich. Um, so Roulotte specializes in those. And then a Mercado, which will be showcasing Portuguese cheese, charcuterie, artisanal produce, craft gins from Portugal. And music, traditional Portuguese guitar music, also a DJ from Portugal, a jazz trio from Portugal with a singer. Um, so, you know, really just trying, really literally bringing a slice of Portugal uh, to London. But of course, um, wine is at the heart of it. So um, we've got this producer lineup list here. We've got over 54, over, no, we have got 54, I think 55 producers actually, um, predominantly artisanal and boutique, as I said, themselves attending. And I think what's you know, for me, really exciting about this. And I worked really hard at this and I was very pleased about it to get every Portuguese region except Le Foix, from which I think in my life I've tasted two wines from Le Foix. Um, so it's going to be the most comprehensive uh, representation of Portuguese wines that has been shown in the UK. Um, so there'll be these really esoteric regions um, that we'll be able to explore and I think really reflecting, as I'm sure Joe would agree, how dynamic uh, the Portuguese wine scene is and uh, certainly I find it hard to keep my finger on the pulse um, because there's just so much going on. So um, 24th, 25th of June, um, festawine.co.uk is the website. Uh, tickets are £35 in advance, and there's a discount for 30 Wine Society members of £5. So, you know, please do throw your hat in your ring and, uh, and join us. So that's Feshta. Um, But let's talk about the wines. So um, we're going to start off with um, Anselmo Menj, uh, Contacto Alvarinho from uh, Vigne Verde. And, um, and for me, you know, one of the really exciting things that I've seen in the last 10 years or so is how much the white wines have come to the fore in Portugal. And actually very often I'll present a tasting and people will be talking about, you know, more excited about the white wines than the red wines from Portugal. And uh, Alvarinho, I think, has certainly led the way um, for premium white wines. And I think has really helped also to change perceptions of Vigne Verde from having been this rather overlooked old fashioned wine with not a lot of fruit to something which has beautiful aromatics and fruit. And uh, it's even on Coronation Street, um, so cool and, you know, trendy and on the pulse is it. Um, and I, I know Wine Society members love Vigne Verde because I've talked a lot to Joe about that. Um, it's a real phenomenon. But anyway, um, Anselmo, is um, Antonio Menge to me is you know one of the Alvarinho uh, gurus. Um, he started his own label in 1998. He um, is born and bred in Monsau, uh, which is um, the area that's really famous for Alvarinho. Um, so we see on this map Vigne Verde, uh, thanks very much, circled there. And the key point here is. Monsau y Molgas, um, which is the sub-region, one of nine, which focuses on Alvarinho, is right at the north um, and in the east of the Vigne Verde region, on the river Minho, just the other side across the river is Spain and Rios Baixas, which you will know, um, Alvarinho, Alvarinho, the same grape variety. Um, and it really thrives in this particular part of Vinever, this particular sub-region, Mont-Saint-Milgas, because it is warmer and drier than other parts of Vinever. In fact, it's even drier than the Dow region. So it's fabulous for producing this amazing purity of fruit that tends to be citrus or apricot, but also we're still in Vinever, so you still get this lovely freshness as well. And that's because we're inland, so it's more continental, the further that you move away from the coast, 
Um, and compared with most Rioja wines, which are from the Salnes subregion, which is very coastal, uh, much more humid, um, the wines from Monsanto Melgas in Portugal tend to be uh, more structured and more depth of fruit in general, I would say, um, because you get this wonderful fruit power and purity. Um, it's, it's an interesting one, Sarah, because I had a question very recently about the difference between the Spanish yeah. Albarino and Portuguese. And of course, there will be differences depending on the on who is the producer. Yeah. To me, although this wine, now that it started to open up, I mean, when, when I first tasted it at the beginning of the year, it was really quite tight and closed. It's got beautiful aromatics now, beautiful fruit. Yeah. But it's 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 still very, very precise, very linear. And I often find the Spanish ones are just a little bit fuller. Now, that could be the more commercial examples, um, mm. a bit fuller, a bit fruitier. Yeah. Um, but the question came in the context of a South African example. So how do you, what's the difference between a South African example and Spanish and Portuguese? And I think unless you've got all three lined up against one another, yeah. it's, it's quite a difficult call. Yes. But they do have this wonderful seam of freshness. Yeah. Um, and that purity, which I just love. Yeah. And what's really amazing about these wines is, is how well they age. I mean, I have tasted, um, I visited in 2012 with Anselmo and we tasted um, all of his Alvarinos. He's an Alvarino specialist, so he's got several Alvarino cuvées all made in different ways. There's a really, the, the, the sort of entry level one is just stainless steel. This wine, Contacto, it's called Contacto because you have a little bit of pre-fermentation skin contact, usually for uh, anything from six to 12 hours, depending on the vintage. And that just, you know, gets an extra bit of flavor and structure coming from the skins. And, uh, and it really helps this wine age. I mean, they reckon it'll age 10 years. And in fact, at Feshta, one of the um, special tastings I'm doing on Saturday evening um, is a tasting of, which I've called Portugal's best kept secrets because I think these wines are unknown for their aging capacity. And we'll be showing the 2020 and the 2011 vintages of Contacto. And Soliero, another Alvarino producer, Joe, that I know that you work with, will be mm -hmm. showing the Primeras Vinhas 2020 and 2010. And then we'll also have um, roughly 10 years apart vintages of Lorero from Quinta de Amial, who I know you've um, worked with in the past, and, and Afrosh. Um, so I think, you know, these wines age brilliantly. And uh, Alvarino in particular, I remember the first time I tasted wines that were perhaps a decade old and they were almost sort of toasty and uh, like lemon butter, um, going a little bit nutty sometimes and, and peachy and fuller. And, uh, and, and they reminded me a little bit of Hunter Valley Senior and, um, or, or an aged uh, Australian Riesling, certainly the more citrus ones, and, or, or you can go in this sort of peachy, nutty direction. So, so they're brilliant wines. Um, and, and, and at the price, you know, to pay what you pay for this wine and for its age for 10 years, I think they're one of the wine world's great bargains. Um, you know, I, you know. I can only agree. I must admit, I'm, I'm long overdue for a visit. I haven't visited Anselmo since 2017, I realised. Mm -hmm. um, so long, long overdue, because when I was last there, he'd only just bought some vineyards, which must be in production now. It's a state here, uh, Quinta de Torre, which is, mm -hmm. he's got, he's now the biggest uh, estate of Alvarinho in Portugal. Um, he's got, I think it's 50 hectares of vineyard and Dirk Newport, he's working with Dirk Newport. Dirk is taking some fruit out of here. Um, so, you know, it's a very grand 14th century manor house and uh, yeah, and Sonna's doing, doing great things there. So and, his, yes. and his son's working with him as well, which is, Diago, is yeah. nice to see, new, new yeah. generation. Yeah. I know, Joe, we're both that old that this next generation is coming up. <laughs> <laughs> I think all the Everywhere. <laughs> all over the place, yeah. And <laughs> a, a brief mention, I mean, I know we, we're, we're talking about this wine this evening, and I, and I should perhaps say a word as to why we chose 
these three wines um, mm. out of the many great wine you know, wines that that, that that Portugal is producing. Um, so they're all wines from producers who are appearing at the uh, festival event on the 24th and 25th of June. I've no idea which wines they're showing, so there may well not be wines they're showing there, but it just seemed to make sense. They're all wines that are appearing in our next 1874 magazine, which comes out, I think, from the 21st of June. Um, a couple of them are wines we follow. The Douro wine we're about to taste um, is a, a new wine to us. Exclusive to all, you. Pardon? That one is exclusive, exclusive to you. So we don't get that at Festa. You no, no, got all of it for, for your members. Um, but in all honesty, it was it was for reasons of practicality as well, because the, the logistical problems currently shipping wine around the world are oh, yeah. pretty challenging. Yeah. So we also went for three wines that we knew were actually here <laughs> in stock, safely on the ground. Um, so hence hence the choice. But there were so many wines that we, we could have chosen, um, one of which actually was would have been um, Anselmo's Red, which... I happen to love Padrusco. Oh, yes. Um, yeah. Which is a, if anyone's tried Vinyaved before and they haven't tried this one, it's definitely worth giving it a go because it's quite mm. different from most Vinyaved that you might come across when you're, when you're traveling in Portugal. Yeah, because um, he's, he's very keen on, um, I pronounce it really badly, Alvaro um, variety. Mm -hmm. um, as well as Vignal, he makes a straight Vignal, and a lot of red Vignal Verd is, is Vignal, which can be quite assertive and aggressive. <laughs> I think we can agree, very high in tannin and acidity, but producers mm -hmm. are taming it and producing more polished wines, but Padrushko is a blend, and um, and it's, it's a lovely, in fact, it's a nice segue into the next wine, which I probably need to move on to the next one. I could talk forever about Anselmo's wine, um, but our next wine is a is, is a claret style. And this is very much part of the trend, as is Anselmo's Padrushko that Joe was just talking about, of, of fresher, lighter wines um, that we're seeing um, in, the, um, in, in Portugal and in all regions of Portugal. So you might not expect to find a light red in the Douro because, of course, it's most famous for port wine. Um, but for me, and if, if um, Anna, we could look at the map of um, Portugal. So if we compare it with Vinho Verde, we're right up in the, in the north. Um, we're well inland. And, um, you know, it's an extreme continental climate um, in the Douro Valley. Um, you know, it goes right up to the border with Spain. And... You know, that explains why, you know, port wine has such a long history there to be able to produce wines of amazing concentration. You only need to see the vineyards and you understand, you know, that these are vines that are struggling to eke out an existence and producing very concentrated bunches of concentrated grapes that are going to produce concentrated wine. So it seems, you know, strange that you can also have um, light reds but I think one of the really exciting things that has emerged you know in the last 20 years really um, in the Douro is for me it's the equivalent of nose to tail eating you know you can make everything in the Douro um, you can make uh, sparkling wine uh, Vertis produces some of the best sparkling wines in Portugal in the Douro um, you can you can have white wines, brilliant white wines, really mineral white wines or fuller styles. You can have light reds, you can have full medium bodied reds, full bodied reds. You can have incredibly delicate dessert wines, as well as you know, all the range of port. And we know that there's a big range of port, beautiful fortified moscatels. So, um, and why is that? So the Douro um, runs roughly 100 kilometers the length of the river. 200 kilometers inland from the Atlantic. And that 100 kilometers, just even going west to east, the Atlantic influence decreases. So you've got, you've got three subregions, different terroir, but then you've got to cut that up as well because north and south bank of the Douro River, different aspects. Then you've got tributaries like the Pinha River is one of the most fam famous ones. Um, so that's also 
um, meaning you've got, you've got west facing and east facing aspects. And then the vineyards go from around 100 meters above sea level by the river up to the highest ones are at 850 meters. And if you think you lose a degree, 0.6 to a degree centigrade for every 100 meters you climb, then you know this is making a big difference uh, to the microclimate and the style of wines that you can make. So here we see Quinta de Pedra Alta. We see on the left, Joao Pirsch, who's the resident winemaker. And on the right, um, we see Matt Gant, um, who is based in Australia. He's actually born in Essex. Um, but he's been in Australia for a long time. And you can see in this picture that they're quite high up. Um, they're in um, up the Pinyao Valley. Um, if you go drive up there, you're climbing all the time. And this vineyard is um, about 450 metres um, above sea level in, um, in a region called Favarche, which is very famous actually for Moscatel, so very aromatic white wines that are traditionally fortified. And, um, and at this sort of elevation, you know, you can produce, you know, lovely Douro table wines um, as opposed to port, um, which is very much the focus, although they also make port. Um, and you can make white wines, you can make red wines, and you can make this beautiful style, which the label is Claret. And that's, um, that's um, Joao Pierge in the Donzaligno uh, vineyard. So one particular variety that they planted, which has lovely freshness and acidity. So claret, you're probably thinking claret, this is weird. What is this claret business? So um, it's actually quite a traditional uh, label that has been used in Spain and Portugal. And you're probably most familiar thinking about it from France and Bordeaux. Um, what it means is literally, literally, it means a sort of lighter style of red wine. And, um, and the rules in Portugal recently um, legislated that to be able to use this um, on the label, the wine has to be uh, light colored and it has to have um, an alcohol, uh, alcoholic strength that doesn't exceed 2.5% volume of the minimum limit legally fixed. So you can't have a sort of 15%er with claret on the label. You know, you, it's, it's got to have a moderate amount of alcohol. This one is only 11.5%. Um, and uh, there's another label that you might see, Paliette, which is a kind of Portuguese style of uh, rosé, which is a bit more full bodied. And that is a phrase which is also now uh, legislated for on the label. And um, it's a paler red or a rosé. You know, it's, is it a bird? Is it a plane? It's uh, a super rosé. Um, and you can have a blend of red and white grapes, up to 15% white grapes. So this reflects a trend towards lighter styles um, of red wine. Um, both of them are quite traditional though in Portugal and there's all sorts of theories about that. Um, but how do you get in the Douro? How do you get a wine um, that's so light and 11.5% alcohol? And it's beautiful and fresh, isn't it? Just almost like fresh strawberry fruit and this lovely um, fresh acidity all the way through. Um, the tannins really smooth. So what's going on here? So first of all, we've got a cooler site because we've got elevation. So, you know, you're going to get lower sugars. Second, we're going to pick pick the grapes early. So most, um, about 64% of this wine, Tinta Barocca, um, is early picked. So about two weeks earlier than, than, than Matt and Joao would normally pick the fruit because they want that really low acidity. They don't want lots of color. They want to keep the freshness in Tinta Barocca, which is quite a thin skinned grape as well. And it is one of the earliest ripening grapes in the Douro. So you still get, you know, sugars, you get a bit of body and you get fruit. So it works really well for this style. And then 20%. So it's probably worth, sorry to interrupt, it's probably worth saying that Tinta Barocca is one of the permitted port grapes. Yeah. And it's, and it's normal, even though it's high yielding, normally it's there to add colour mm. and tannin okay. and structure. So, they, yeah. so they, they tend to let it ripen and it's, Absolutely. It's arguably one of the more rustic permitted grapes. Yeah. Certainly if you ever taste it on its own as a table wine, it can be on the rustic side, can't it? Yeah. Um, whereas here, they've achieved a wonderful delicacy in yeah. the wine. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I, 
if you if you'd asked me to have a stab at what the grapes were, I would never have said yeah, Tinderbrock. That's for yeah. sure. You know. Yeah. Have you ever tasted Joao Nicola de Almeida made a wine when he was at Muxaga, uh, a, a single varietal Tinderbrocca, which reminded me, Joe, you will be as surprised as I was of a Cabernet Franc from the Loire, and I just <laughs> couldn't believe that it was Tinderbrocca for all the mm-hmm. reasons that you say, because. It's, it's the reliable sugar source for port to get the body and, you know, um, because it ripens early, but because they let it hang for a long mm-hmm. time. Um, so here, picked early, picked two weeks earlier than they would for a Doro wine and probably quite a bit earlier than if you were making a port. But it's also um, 20% co-fermented Tariga Nacional and Donzellinia Branco. So Donzellinia Branco is a white grape variety and 16% co-fermented Tinta Barocca and Rabigato, another white variety. So we've got quite a lot of white grapes in here as well, which are bringing acidity and bringing freshness to the blend. Also, we've got 25% whole bunch ferment and whole bunch ferment tends to mean that you get paler wines. And because the stems are in the fermentation process, and the stems, as you would know, if you bit one, they're quite bitter and they don't have sugar. So again, that's, you know, there's less sugar to convert into alcohol. So that's helping you with your uh, lower alcohol, you 11 and a half percent. Not a lot of time on skins um, and it's unoaked. So, you know, or, or the early pick tint of Barocca is unoaked. Uh, the two co-fer- co-ferments are aged in older, bigger format French oak barrels. So you're just looking to just produce this light, fresh style and just really keep that beautiful fruit and delicacy in the wine. So Joe, I think it's a great buy for, you know, for, for men. No, I must admit, they, they probably thought, why on earth, if we're only just starting with them, why on earth buy this wine? Joao said to me he, that he'd been experimenting with this style since 2018, I think. So not all that long, but yeah. clearly had a vision as to what he wanted to, to produce. And at the time, you know, I wasn't looking for a, a classical Dura red. I was looking for something a bit different. You know, we've definitely mm-hmm. seen a trend towards lighter reds. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And I thought this one was very well managed. I mean, you mentioned the whole bunch. I don't get any of the bitterness, any of the pith- yep. sort of pithiness that you sometimes get in those wines. Um, I, I'm not getting any of the reduction that you sometimes get in these wines. So, yeah, I just thought it was a, a delightful yeah. thing. We just need the sun to come out now. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it's funny, actually, because Matt um, introduced me to a producer who's also in the Pina Valley, Tiago Sampaio, um, who who will be at Festa. And I was judging at the Alternative Wine Variety Show in Australia. And then at the judges' dinner, everyone brought along something to surprise people. And I was rather embarrassed to be surprised by a Portuguese wine, (laughs) (laughs) which was from Tiago. And it was in this light style. And it was from Mm -hmm. his family's old vineyards, which are roughly 50-50 red and white grapes. So it produced naturally this pale light style that was intensely mineral. And uh, yeah, so that was... um, so I'm sure that was Matt's inspiration for this mm-hmm. wine. But Matt, um, I know from a, for a long time from working in Australia, and coincidentally, he worked at St. Hallett in the Barossa, who um, planted out what, what is regarded as the mother source of Tariga Nacional in the Barossa that everyone takes cuttings from. And when he set up his own label um, with a partner called First Drop, um, he was very much working with Portuguese varieties, not just Tariga Nacional. He even made a Trincadera, a sparkling red, which he gave me a bottle of when I was in Australia. And it was amazing. And unfortunately, the vineyard was pulled up, you know, because one of these niche it things. Yeah. But Matt did a vintage in 2007 um, with a producer called Azamor in Alentejo. And that's where he met Joao Pige. Um, and they became fast friends. And then... Matt is Matt's brother went to school with one of the owners of um, Quinta de Pedra Alta. Matt's on the right there, um, who is Ed Woodward, who you may have heard of because he was the CEO of Manchester United Football Club. And um, Ed and his wife, Isabel, uh, bought the estate in 2018. So I think uh, Matt was very much involved and Lewis uh, Piers on the left there was already the resident winemaker, so uh, took it over, yeah. 
Um, and uh, and they've been, you know, really focusing on making a very dynamic range of wines. And uh, and I think this is a great example. I just saw someone mention about, you know, it's quite Beaujolais-like in a way. It's that sort of level of freshness and lovely fruit and just those very uh, soft, smooth tannins. Yeah, yeah. It's it. I I I too love that sort of silky texture about it. It's a, mm. you know very very easy wine to slip down. Yeah, almost sort of pellucid, isn't it? It's just very trans. It's very transparent wine. It's not trying to be anything too clever. It's just pleasing you and pleasing, uh -huh. you know, pleasing you for a summer drink and um, you know something to chill a little bit. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, lovely wine. And 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 the, well, Joe, you'll find quite a lot of those styles of wines at Feshta. There's a lot of producers uh, right. going for what they call glue glue wines, as mm -hmm. in glug glug or van der Swaff. Um, and uh, we could call them in uh, in Portugal. I think you will, you know, I'm my Portuguese is not very good, and I think members and you will get this too. Picnic wines, <laughs> picnic reds. <laughs> okay, so maybe we should move on to our next wine and um, probably should. From uh, Badio in uh, the Barada region, and uh, Joe and I were talking at the beginning, and Joe was explaining that you know we wanted to make sure we, that we were showing wines that were at Feshta, um, but which also you know were going to definitely be in stock, so you you could all taste with us. Um, and uh, I've just lost my train of thought. What I was going to say? Um, mm -mm -mm. No. It's gone. Did, it, did, did it relate to um, other uh, other wines of, of theirs that that? Ah, oh, no. I remember you and I were talking at the beginning, and Joe, you mentioned in some ways it would have been good to have more of a contrast in the red. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. But I think you know, and and I think here what we're seeing is we're in the Barada region, which naturally gives a lot of freshness to the wine. So in the Duro, you have to work at it to get that freshness in the wine and. I talked about the early picking, um, the particular grape varieties that they've chosen, um, the very light extraction, all sorts of techniques used to, to manage the ripeness um, and produce a wine that's very light and fresh in a region which also produces poor wine. Whilst when you go to Barrado, and um, thanks Anna there for the map, you see it's sort of in central Portugal. And the key point here is, it's by the coast. And, and not only that, um, the region is relatively flat. There's some sort of rolling hills, um, but then you climb up the Serra Caramulu and the Serra Busaco up into the Dao region. And the function of those mountains is if you like to keep in um, the maritime, humid maritime breezes in the Barada region and keep them out of the Dow. So in the Dow, we tend to see more, you know, the Dow does produce lovely, elegant, fresh wines, but you do tend to see more ripeness. And in Barada, you tend to get wines that are fresher and with more assertive acidity. And especially with this great variety called Bagger. And uh, a few years ago, I was in the region uh, for a week researching an article for the world of fine wine about uh, Bagger. And something that I had not known was that well over 50% of the grapes uh, were going to Matthias Rosé um, because Sograp have a Matthias Rosé uh, facility in, in, um, in the Barada region. And for them, Bagger is completely important because you get this lovely freshness and acidity are guaranteed it in the, in the um, Barada region. And from a grower's point of view, uh, <laughs> and, uh, a winemaker at uh, Alianza described um, Barada as one of the worst places in Portugal to grow grapes and make wine from late cycle grape varieties like Baga. So um, because it's humid, because it often rains around the equinox, so around the 21st of September, um, it's a real challenge to make red wines and to get the phenolic, get the tannin ripeness. Um, but if you're a grower 
And, you know, you're not making the wine, you know, you haven't got this ambition to make a strapping red wine, then actually it's much easier to sell your grapes at a much earlier stage. You don't have to worry about the rain. You're going to pick, you know, you're going to pick because it's going to a rosé wine well before harvest. You, you know, you can pack up and go on holiday, you know, in the end of August or something. And, uh, and you've sold your grapes to, for Matty's rosé. So, so I, but I was surprised to know how much of the, the grapes went to Matty's rosé. Mm-hmm. Um, so if you want to produce ripe baguette, there's a lot of work that happens in the vineyard. And it's also incredibly important to choose a good site. So uh, Vadio, uh, the couple behind it are um, Luis Patrao and his wife, um, Eduarda Diaz. There they are in uh, one of the vineyards. And the key point about this vineyard is it's a young vineyard, which um, Luis and his father, Dinish, planted. They uh, made their first wine in 2005, father and son. Um, And uh, the new vineyards, um, they wanted to trellis them and they wanted to train the canopy really carefully so that they could be sure to manage yields so that they could get ripe red grapes. Because the fewer grapes that you have on the vine, the more likely you are to be able to get them ripe because you're giving the vine less work to do. If you load it up with loads of grapes, then you know, you're know you not gonna, it's, it's gonna take longer to get those grapes ripe. Um, and a lot of old vines in the region, certainly, you know, Louis Patrao um, found that the canopies, were really big and sprawling. So these are old vines. Um, they're just staked to a post. And if you just let them go, then the canopy is really sprawling and all over the place. You'll get a lot of grapes. And of course, that's fine if you're selling your grapes to, you know, for Matthias Rosé, for a rosé wine. But if you want to make a red wine, then you're going to have to do a lot of work to prune it, you know, like Philippa Pato, uh, Dieppe Nieport working in Barada, they do an awful lot of work, you know, manicuring the old vines um, to make sure that they get quality fruits that they can get ripe. But that wasn't really the tradition in the region. Um, so here we see um, Louis Patrao in an old vineyard. So there, Eduardo and, and Louis and, and, and uh, Louis's dad, Dinis, have progressively bought vineyards. And um, and this wine, the Vadio 2018 Red, is coming from a blend from across different parcels with young vine and old vine fruit. And to me, it's really typical of uh, Barada. You know, if you look at it, it's, you know, it's 2018, which was a, which was a good year. It's a little bit pale, isn't it? It's not the deepest red wine. And people often make comparisons with um, Baga to uh, Nebbiolo and Pinot Noir. And this almost has some of that sort of Nebbiolo, slightly bricky notes in it. And, uh, and I often find with uh, Vadio's wines, I remember um, it was a decanter panel tasting probably five, six years ago. And I was uh, judging with another MW and uh, a sommelier. Um, and they were both saying, goodness, these wines, they really, if you wanted Nebbiolo, if you bought these wines, you'd think you'd done really well. You know, and, and on that, it's really important to say that um, Lewish and um, Eduarda have a policy of stashing away um, this wine, which is their entry level bagger for 10 years to show that it can age and releasing it at 10 years. And in fact, I was just in uh, Barada last month, um, for International Bagger Day, which I'll tell you about later. Um, and I tasted the 2012 vintage of this wine and, uh, and it was looking very good indeed, still time on its side. So again, another wine from Portugal that I think, you know, it's, it's a relatively modest price, but they can age so well, they have so much character. And already this young wine has lots of character. We managed to buy a couple of years ago. We managed to buy a little parcel of the 2010 that they had re-released, um, which was it was a wonderful opportunity to show the two, yeah. you know, the young wine and the older wine side by side. Yeah. Um, do I mean 2010? 
and I, but I think what is what is fascinating is how so much thought has gone into and it, you know it's, it's it's not only here in Portugal in in, in Barada it's in so many other parts of the world is in these regions where the wines were in all honesty traditionally wines that you had to keep to make them palatable you know unless you were having them with the local suckling pig yeah you know it, they were quite difficult wines to yeah. drink in their use yes and i think what they've managed to do by really focusing on primarily on the vineyards mm. and then also that the care in the cellar so that you're you're careful to uh only extract according to the vintage um, in order to end up with something that, yes, is a structured wine. There's acidity, mm. there's, there's some strong tannin there, but there are no rough edges. Yes. And I haven't decanted my bottle. Clearly, if I decanted it, it would be, it would be yeah. more open as well. Yeah. Um, and I think that's, uh, that I, is one of those things that I'm finding fascinating about these wines is that they are accessible. And mm. that's why, actually, um, they, these guys have been very clever in holding back even a little for a tiny producer to make that investment is yeah. is quite something. Yeah, uh, you know, and I think it's great because they're saying that actually the wines we're making these days um, they are more accessible when they're young, but you can keep them as well. Yes, so it's certainly something that I'm keen to try and do at the wine society yeah. to keep back some of this stock. Yeah, so you're great at doing that. I think uh, because I, I should say that I have been a member back from my lawyer days. <laughs> okay. Before I thought about wine career, I have been a member of the Wine Society for over 20 years. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I mean, the opportunity to buy older parcels and special parcels is, uh, is you know, is in, and wines at you age as well is, uh, you know, I think a huge advantage for, for members. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I think, Joe, what you were saying about Barada, um, I mean, it's just changed so much, even in the last 10 years. Um, you know, Lewis Bateau was almost a lone voice, mm -hmm. you know, who, um, you know, he made his first wine, I think it was 1980, decided to go full-time in wine in 1985. And he introduced green harvesting. He was the first person to green harvest in Portugal. And when he asked his winemakers to do it, they said, it's against God, we can't do it. Uh, because you have a lot of, you know, um, people who are very religious and older generation still working the vineyards. If you go out in the vineyards, you know, people in their 70s, 80s, you know, working those vineyards, like, I mean, they're like their gardens. Um, and uh, so Lewis introduced that. He started destemming grapes rather than fermenting whole bunch because obviously their stems are going to bring tannin. Uh, started controlling the yields, as Joe said, much more. And um, and the other key thing, the the sort of vineyard point is is the chalky clay soils. Um, and when you plant on chalky clay soils, first of all, some of them you just can see chalk limestone scattered all over the place, and it reflects light back onto the grapes and that helps with the ripening process and the chalk also just like in uh, Kunawara in Australia people talk about it as well it just is a, a, a sort of sponge it holds water and it can be quite warm in the summer but um, it means that the the vines aren't sitting in wet clay because it's lime chalky clay soil so the limestone just absorbs that bit of moisture and then gives it back when the vines need it in summer but it means that the vines are not sitting in wet soil in in, in the spring and the growth process can get going for this late ripening grape variety and uh, and what you've seen now is a whole chorus of producers and Anna if we could have that um, bag of friends uh, photo um, in um, 2010 no, 2012, formally, this group got together called Bag of Friends. And when I was uh, in Barada last month, I was there for International Bagger Day, which is the 21st uh, of May. In May, So please make a note in your diaries uh, for next year and successive years, because that will be uh, International Bagger Wine Day. Is, and, is, it always, uh, is it always the 21st, irrespective of when that day falls? Well, I, I think you have to do that, don't you? If it's a, I think they do. Well, maybe not. No, I, I'd, well, that's a good question, Joe. 
because of course this year it was a Saturday, yeah. which was a good day to have a, a wine dinner. So mm -hmm. you're right, it might change. But I love the fact that they have such confidence now in Bagger that they launched this uh, International Bagger Wine Day this year, which celebrates 10 years of Bagger Friends, this group getting together, which Louis Pato's daughter, Philippa Pato on the left there, uh, and in the middle, Mario Sergio from uh, Quinta das Bagieras. I know that, Joe, you've bought some of the wines from there in the past. In the past yeah. um, you see Dirk Newport in the middle, um, who actually bought an estate there in 2012. And Dirk has said of Barada that it is perhaps the finest terroir in Portugal. Um, so, you know, and he, he describes it as this ugly duckling that, you know, nobody wanted to you know, to buy wines from Barada and especially Bagger in Portugal in the last 15 years. Now, only the kind of old timers who love those, you know, wines that you have to stick away for 15 years that Joe was talking about before you could drink them. And now uh, Barada and Bagger is the darling of all the sommeliers and the top restaurants, you know, and, uh, and it's a lot to do with Bagger Friends. And Eduarda and um, Luis were invited to join Bagger Friends this year, which is great because, you know, it's all part of this uh, changing um, wave of change in Barada and Baga and working with this grape in a way that both um, William Brutus, who you see third from the left there, is Philippa's husband, he's a sommelier, and, and Luis Patrao from Vadio have both described Baga as a plastic grape variety. And nobody really knew this before, but I suppose the clues were there because it was going into Matthias Rosé and it was making these incredibly austere, very long-lived wines. But now, you know, producers are making glue-glue styles and they're making wines that are to put in the cellar for decades. Uh, they're making a lot of sparkling wine as well from uh, Bagger, um, often in a Blanc de Noir style or Rosé style. So it's an immensely versatile grape. And as Joe said, uh, Lewis and Eduardo have shown that you can have very accessible wines that can age very well too. Sarah, you've been there more often than me. It's it strikes me, it's not one of the partly because because of what you described in terms of the the, uh, the you know the geography. It, it's not a spectacular region. Mm. Um, and and <laughs> certainly when I was last there, I certainly wouldn't have said it was particularly geared up for tourism. No. Um, but I have to say, one of the most magical experiences I've had visiting vineyards was with Philippa Patter, who was in the, on the left in that, in that picture there. And she had finally, after many years, uh, courting an elderly neighbour, um, <laughs> had managed to get hold of a particular parcel of, of vines. And they were... They were similar to the to, to the picture you showed earlier of of, of Luis in the in the old uh, mm. vineyard, but even worse, even older, even more gnarled, and and she was gradually eking them into something that she could work with. So gradually mm. turning them into um, a, a, a more productive vineyard again with a single post. But it yeah. was taking it was taking years, literally, because you have to yeah. handle these old vine. You know they're they're like an elderly person. You have to handle them with, with care and sensitivity. And she was gradually returning them to mm. something that would allow them to produce fine quality yeah. again. And it was just magical to see, I have to say. Yeah. No, she, 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 I, I went with her to it's probably the same area. I think it's called Silva. And, uh, and they were pruning and she was saying that one vineyard that they'd acquired they maybe got 60 kilos of grapes because, you know, you have to take those vi old vines that have been allowed to sprawl, which is why Louis Vadil wasn't keen to work with old vines originally. Um, you have to really prune them back hard and some of them will die, you know, um, and, and the yields will really fall back, but then they will come, you know, and uh, uh, Philippa and William's top wine, um, Miss, Miss Ao, uh, meaning mission, <laughs> you mm. know, is an amazingly complex, wild almost wine, and you really feel the old vines in it, which is exciting. Mm. Absolutely. No, it is exciting stuff. It really is. Mm. 
No, I've been, I've been seeing one or two one. questions pop up, but 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 yeah. have have a chance to read them properly. So, Anna, are you going to uh, help us? Yeah, absolutely. I will help, of course. You've actually been answering so many of them as you go. I don't know whether it's okay. happened reading <laughs> sneakily on the side, but it's fantastic. <laughs> so I thank you both so much, and thank you. That was really fascinating. Um, I was sort of scrolling away and writing notes, and um, I'm really excited. I've mentioned to Joe and Sarah, I've got a, the end of a cold, so I didn't actually want to open the wines, and I hope Tim won't mind if I open them tomorrow <laughs> when I'm yeah. feeling a little better. And I'm really excited, um, having only tried uh, the third one, I'm really excited to try the other two. Members seem to have really enjoyed them as well. We've included some other wines as you've been talking on links. Members, if you haven't seen, we have got, for example, um, Sarah and Joe were just talking about the sparkling wines made from Bagger. We have actually got uh, Vadeo's sparkling wine on sale at the moment Beautiful. on the website, Beautiful for example. Wine. Yeah, so I've included a few links, but I will use the use the follow up email tomorrow to mop up all those links if you haven't been following the chat uh, to to link in some other styles that Joe and Sarah have mentioned as they've been going along. So I'm going to kick off, I apologise, with um, my own personal question, so I can decide my dinner tomorrow, <laughs> which is, I mentioned at the beginning, we were going to talk about food pairings. Um, what would, um, perhaps each of you could recommend a dish or a couple of dishes with each wine, that would be lovely. So starting with Sarah. Yeah, um, I mean, with with Alvarinho, that Alvarinho, I, I would love like a, like brown crab on toast. Mm. Mm. <laughs> lovely. Mm. Really. And Joe, yeah. for, for the other reason, wonderful. We, we one thing that we love when we can get them are large prawns that we then smother with lots of um, other we barbecue, and then smother with lots of garlicky butter and pass fresh parsley, black leaf parsley. So yes, you've got quite a strong flavour from the parsley and from the from the grilling of the prawns, but. I think this wine's probably got enough muscle to handle it, and it's certainly got the freshness to cut through all that all that butter. And uh, yeah, yeah, it would just be delicious. Mm. Wonderful, yeah. thank you both very much. Uh, so on to the the second wine, so our Claret Duro. Possibly, I would imagine. Well, maybe challenging or maybe easier. I'm not sure. Yeah. I haven't tried it. I would. Um, I'm I'm pescatarian actually, but I mean I think that. Um, I'm sure at Barduro, a wine like that, they would be thinking about, you know, uh, Portuguese ham with it, you know, cold plates. Mm -hmm. um, as a as a pescatarian, I, I think it would go really well with something like Piedmontese peppers. Okay, lovely. Yeah. That's, that's a really nice thought, actually. Peppers, I think, could work very well mm -hmm. because you've got the sweetness of the peppers, but you've then got the nice cut, cut of acidity here. Um, yeah. As a meat eater, I think you could easily have this wine with, with poultry or pork um, quite easily, but certainly with charcuterie, you know, I'd love it with that. But, it, but also with, a, with, with, with grilled fish, you know, I, th I think particularly as we're, you know, coming into barbecue season, some of those, those fish that work well, like swordfish or tuna on the barbecue, I think it could work really nicely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Fabulous. And then last but not least, um, our bagger from Barreda. Yeah, I think that wine, um, I would go with actually one of the first dishes that I had when I visited Barreda in 2004. And I remember having dinner with Louis Pato and Philippa Pato. And, and because I don't eat meat, I think everyone else was having the old suckling pig. Um, but I had um, a sort of other, all cooked in one dish, like a like one of those sort of like cast iron casserole dishes, um, salt cod of course, back below, mm. <laughs> but cooked with like tons of olive oil and garlic, and uh, what the Portuguese call punch potatoes, which sounds very violent, but actually it's it's sort of the same principle of when you make roast potatoes here and you sort of bash them up a bit so you get really nice crispy bits and that flavors of garlic and bay leaf get, you know really sink into the potatoes so uh so yeah again you know lots of olive oil lots of garlic strong flavors and this would stand up to it beautifully and really cleanse the palate on the finish um so that would be my go-to sounds delicious that sounds wonderful <laughs> because i think i think what's interesting and and you mentioned nebbiolo it's i find that the same with with, with that too 
these wines, even though they're pale in colour, there is plenty of structure mm. there. Mm. Um, and there's there's actually plenty of flavour. I mean, you know, it, yeah. it's quite, you know, quite long on the palate. Um, we had a Nebbiola the other evening with a with a rather rich uh, pasta uh, ragu. Um, and, and I could see something like this equally working with that. Mm. But my personal preference when I get, get a wine like this would be, again, it, it, it's, it, you know, it's reverting to, well, I, either the sort of richer flavours that you might have in the autumn and winter where something mm. like this is, is robust enough and rich enough or, or has the structure to cut through the richness of those dishes. Yeah. Or it goes back to, you know, just tasty grilled stuff you know and that can be grilled veg um you know i could go back to the peppers that you mentioned earlier um mm -hmm. you know, very happily but it amazes me actually in portugal they serve red with with bacalao yes. just as often if not more often than than uh than white um yeah. you know often so even with a more robust dura red for example so mm -hmm. yeah i would agree i think that would work incredibly yeah. well <laughs> We've got everyone yeah, salivating. I'm hungry now. Yeah. I guess I'm feeling hungry now. <laughs> exactly. Um, we have had one more question, but it's about mm -hmm. travel. And what I would suggest is, um, Donald, we have got the Wine Society community is an incredible place to um, ask fellow members about travel arrangements. But since we do have two masters here, I'm going to ask it anyway, because they're, they're well versed in Portuguese travel. And I think um, I'm sure Sarah will have some ideas. Um, are there any, I'm assuming you mean producers, Donald, so I'll ask that. Are there any producers worth visiting in Alentejo when Donald visited, visits in September? Oh, goodness. Well, mm -hmm. I mean, it's, I don't know when you're going, but um, a date which is in my diary, which, um, as Joe rightly observed, these dates can change because Saturdays are useful. Um, Herdad de Rossim in Vidigera do an amazing event called uh, Amphora Wine Day because... Um, I don't know if you have any Talia wines, Joe, um, but Talia wines are new, a tradition in Alentejo for making wines fermenting on skins in wet, white and red in, in big clay amphora, which in Portugal are called Talia. It's a tradition that's being revived. And uh, her dad, the Rosima, one of the, uh, you know, modernists and making an amazing amount of more traditional and very modern styles of clay-made wines, but they have amphora wine day where they invite loads of Portuguese producers, also some international producers to show the wines and, and they do an amazing job. So that's a definite, but honestly, there's so many. And what I would suggest is in Evora, um, the Alentejo Wine Commission, who have a great website, in fact, it's great on Tally Wines, they, um, they have a tasting room. So it's a great opportunity to go there and just be able to taste. I think it's free. I might be wrong there, but I think it is. Um, but they also have a map which shows all the producers who have a tasting room. And actually compared, I don't know what you think, Joe, but compared with other regions in Portugal, it's actually quite easy to get around Alentejo <laughs> because a lot of them you just get lost, you know, if you're <laughs> driving around the Douro or uh, even Barada. But Alentejo is actually very easy to navigate and they have a great map and they give you all the details. You can probably download it, in fact, off from their website. Um, and it's, you know, self, self-guided, um, it, you know, it's, um, yeah, it's a really easy way to do it, but, you know, definitely go, I would say. So. And I, you know, I, I would, I would add that, um, don't forget that even though Portugal's a small country, um, some of the distances are quite big and Alentejo is a big region. So it's definitely worth doing some prep before you go but if you can go to to to, to a center like that you can then go out from there yeah um and i was looking very recently at the wines of alentejo website um because they launched their new sustainability program in london a couple mm. of couple of weeks ago um and that website gives quite a lot of information about what the region is doing it, it talks about many many producers um, and, you know, the different stages that they're at. But this, this really impressive, I have to say, really impressive programme that they have established in terms of delivering sustainability in the, in the vineyards, the whole, the whole winemaking process. And I'm pretty sure, I didn't click on it because I was looking for other things, but I'm pretty sure that there was a tourism 
button yeah, uh, that, yeah, that you could click on there. Yeah, and then that will give you a really good place because fantastic. lots of these people have accommodation, lots of them have restaurants. Yeah. So definitely do, do a little bit of meandering there. Or the Wines of Portugal, the Vinnie Portugal website. Again, they have very good access. They weren't, it, it's not totally comprehensive, but there's, there's quite a lot of information there as well. Yeah. Thank you both so much. Yeah, I've popped the link in the chat whilst you were saying it, Joe. I had a quick look and it's, it's a brilliant resource. So, Donald, good it day. sounds like you've picked the right place to go. <laughs> <laughs> I think I forgot come? to say that I'm for a wine day is based around St. Martin's Day, a festival, a festa, which is on the 21st of November. Okay. Um, but the Amphora Wine Day is, is on a Saturday, but it's a great way. It's a lot of fun because all the local like Tashkas who actually themselves make these tally wines and serve them direct from Amphora. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's brilliant. It's such good fun. So it's a really great time to go. And, and Whenever I've been, the weather has been sunny and in the 20s in November. So this is another good reason to go. Yeah. That's perfect. It's a date, I think. That is it? <laughs> well, on that note, year. I'll hand over to Joe to do a final roundup. But it sounds like you've got us all in the mood for festivals, Sarah. So everyone needs to think about Festa. You've got us all in the mood to travel to Portugal. And you've yeah. got us all in the mood to have some delicious dinner this evening alongside your wine. So what more could we ask for? Mm. Um, so thank you both so much. Thank and you. Joe, thank you again for hosting. A pleasure as always. And I will just hand over to you for a final goodbye. Yeah, I just want to say a huge thank you to Sarah. I know you have been unbelievably busy getting this huge event <laughs> organised, as well as just a bit of decanter wine awards judging along the way. <laughs> um, so thank you so much for giving up Absolutely your pleasure. time, yeah. telling us about this exciting event, which I'm really looking forward to. I know it's London and many of our people listening may not be London based. Um, but with a bit of luck, it, it's something that will that will happen again. But anyway, yeah. very best of luck with it. Thank you. I really hope the train strike, threatened train strike, doesn't mm. scupper your scupper your uh, enjoyment of the day. Um, but yeah, best of luck with that. Thanks again. Uh, thanks to the tastings team for keeping things moving behind the scenes uh, and organising the, the the wines for us to taste. So um, yeah, thank you. Cheers. Thank you. And thanks everyone for cheers. listening. Everyone. Yeah. Cheers. Cheers. Um, Enjoy your salad. supper. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>